clock on my computer says 6.30. And so we're going to start. And since, uh, you know, there's a kind of a theme of this about managing time, we're going to manage our time really well. And uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll jump in. Father, thank you. Um, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity for us to gather together as believers, to feel uh, unity in our hearts and a kindred spirit here, that we are brothers and sisters, and that we come to seek you tonight, your wisdom for living. And as we, Lord, commit ourselves to apply your principles from your word, we know that there is blessing. Um, doesn't mean it's always easy, God, but the blessing uh, of your hand is upon us. And I pray that you give us the courage to think differently and to act differently and that those kinds of um, changes would result, Lord, in some really good things for us in our lives. So bless this time. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, this study was actually born out of a discussion that Dan Pierce and I were having over a period of weeks, and we thought about putting it off until the fall. But the more I thought and prayed about it, it just seemed right for us to jump right in. Um, as we kind of looked across the church, uh, one of the uh, big subjects that we've never really approached is the subject of building margins into our lives. And as we've talked to some volunteers and people in general who are just burned out and you know, the RPMs of life is creeping higher and higher and higher into that red zone, and it seems like the needle is pegged and staying there. It was um, just of the Lord for us to say, let's talk about it. Let's just throw it out here, and let's um, look at God's Word and find wisdom from it. Now, what brings another level of complication to it is some of us are, are driven, and we feed off of some of the uh, challenge of living life like that. I'm a, I'm a recovering achievement aholic, <laughs> and and some of you um, maybe can relate to that as well. And I think this series, in particularly for you, is going to be very encouraging to you. I hope so. Um, really, the the journey of my spiritual life goes hand in hand with this of just letting go, go of control, of trusting God. And then even more recently, after 20 years here at the Brook, of just really feeling that um, I've got to make some real changes in my lifestyle from the standpoint of managing my time. And what happens is that these systems kind of run on their own. It's subconscious to many uh, degrees and on many levels. You're going and going and going, and you have these moments of pause that give you enough energy to kind of get through the next bit of life, um, but meanwhile, the substance of, of most of life is weariness and a sense of uh, quality missing, and so you, you navigate life like that over a period of years and years and years, I think, as I have done, without serious breaks and um, uh, time to reflect. And it takes its toll. There's a cumulative effect is what I'm trying to say to you. So if you're on the younger end of the spectrum, um, you'll see us who are a little bit older, you know, we're doing a lot of this and we're talking about this. So take heed because you don't want to kind of end up years from now, um, you know, in bad shape. And even worse than that, by God's grace, you know, hopefully not shipwrecking, which can really happen. I mean, that's kind of the, the worst part of the result. So um, this is speaking exactly to where I am, and I was so excited to share this particular uh, message tonight because of the study that I've uh, been on for the last few weeks and months. Most of you remember that I took a sabbatical right after Christmas and between that and the, the new year. It was much needed, and I appreciate the elders. Um, and so there's been a lot of reading about it a lot of thinking about it, and hopefully I'm going to be able to share some of that with you tonight. So let's look at what this series is going to be. You've got your notes there. This is the outline of what we're going to be covering on these Wednesday nights. And we've got various speakers um, who will be doing it. I'm, I'm teaching tonight and next week, and then Ron Helley is 
leading us on financial stewardship. All this is the theme, remember, of building margins into our life, building space, white space <laughs> into our lives, whereby we have room um, away from the edge. <laughs> and, and that's the goal. And then we're going to take a break on May 6th. We're going to have a, a big prayer gathering here at the Brook. How many of you were able to attend the um, Good Friday interactive worship? Yeah, that was a really special night for us all. And for me, one of the most special things was just seeing so much prayer going on and seeing our pastors and elders getting to pray with people. We're going to create a similar night that night and have a lot of prayer. And then um, Dan Pierce is going to talk about building margins in relationships and with family. Um, Then we have a series break for reunion. And then margins in serving. Um, I haven't confirmed the speaker for that yet, but then on June 3rd, Emotional Boundaries is going to be led by Rich Kozak, um, our counselor here. All right, so let's talk about Sabbath living, okay? Sabbath living. Um, the word Sabbath is from the Hebrew word Shabbat, meaning cessation or time of rest. And I want to look into the Old Testament because this is where the concept originates as a way of helping us really grasp what God is trying to do for us by providing this gift of Sabbath. Genesis 2, 1 through 3 is the foundation of the whole idea of Sabbath living. Here's what it says. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. You see a word that keeps coming up there, rest. God rested. So this text establishes the precedent for which future Sabbath commandments will be based. This text is talking about God finished his work of creating the entire universe. And by the way, you've got to understand that, right? God's work of creation is done. Now, there may be um, spinoffs and there's resulting effects, right? But God finished his work in six days. God rested on the seventh day because his creation was finished. And God blessed and sanctified the seventh day because on it he rested. This is the interesting thing to me, is there's this relationship between rest and holiness, Rest and sanctification. Now, in our American culture, we really have a hard time with that because, you know, some of us have the sense of guilt when we relax. And so rather than truly resting and finding restoration, what we end up doing is having kind of little pauses to life where we might veg out but nothing is being recreated in us from the rest that we're getting. And and I want to challenge that kind of way of thinking and doing life and even challenge the way that we tend to think about what the Sabbath should should be. Okay, The important thing to notice in this passage is that there is no commandment in this text, not this one. Okay, There's no commandment to take the Sabbath, to make it holy, that kind of thing. The seventh day, even in this text, is not even called the Sabbath. The word is not even used here in the creation account. But the seventh day in this text is differentiated. It is set apart from the other six creation days, and it is assigned a special significance, a special blessing by God based on the fact that it was the day on which God rested. All subsequent commands to keep the Sabbath assume that the sanctity of the seventh day has already been established. All right? It's already there, and it was established at creation, and it was established by God. Here's another reference. I'm not going to read this for you, but some of you will know and remember this reference in Exodus 16 about manna being provided in the wilderness to the children of Israel. And so... um, Manna every day would show up for them to eat. It was a daily provision. It was a very present tense provision. But in this account, God provided twice as much manna on the sixth day and provided no manna 
on the seventh day. And the manna that he provided on the sixth day, the Bible says, would not spoil, but would last until the seventh day. So the commandment was for them not to go and gather manna on the seventh day. It was, it's called in this passage, a Sabbath for the Lord, too. It was a Sabbath for God because he didn't provide the manna on that day. He provided twice as much on the day before. And it was a Sabbath for the people um, to go out and to have to gather the, the provision from God. So here's, here's the ideal here, okay, in this passage. God provided twice as much on the sixth day. On the seventh day, there was rest. Next. It is the first occurrence of the term Sabbath. First occurrence of the term. It's interesting because what happened in creation now is being transferred from God to now his people. And we have now the command to rest on the Sabbath, to not do any work on the Sabbath. It's the first time in the Bible that Israel is commanded to observe a Sabbath practice of any kind. And it's surrounding, of course, manna. Manna was not to be gathered on the seventh day because it was a Sabbath to the Lord. That's what I just said, a Sabbath to the Lord where God did not even work on that day. All right? So here's the theme developing. What God did is now being transferred and commanded to his people in this context and there are many other references to Sabbath, by the way. I'm not going through all of them. But here's, here's the big one. This is the one that's a part of the Ten Commandments. This is the fourth commandment. All right? Exodus 20. Somebody read that. That way I'm not the only one talking. You've got it there. I think it's on your notes. Okay, so the fourth commandment, the first four commandments of the ten had to do with our relationship to God. The other six have to do with our relationship to each other. This fourth one, the final one in relationship to the Lord, talks about the Sabbath and, and exactly what it means. This is very thorough, right? This is very long. So let me break down some things. First of all, the passage says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, remember goes back to the creation account. Doing what God did. Remember that it was holy, that God rested on the seventh day. Next, he says, keep the Sabbath holy. Now, this is interesting. Keep the Sabbath holy. In other words, protect it in holiness. It's not a command to sanctify the Sabbath. It's not a command to make the Sabbath holy. The Sabbath was already holy. It was holy when God rested on the seventh day. It was sanctified there in creation. But they are con to conduct themselves in such a way as not to profane the Sabbath. It's already been declared holy. Don't make it unholy by the way that you behave. Next, the whole idea here is the cessation of work. Let's just let that kind of sit for a second. Some of you may, that's a pretty easy concept to grasp. Some of you, it may not be. It, it, it can be a little foreign to you. The cessation of work. We're going to talk about what that means in a little bit. All right? Ceasing to labor. The Sabbath does not necessarily mean, though, being finished with work. Most of us don't finish all the work that we need to do in six days, right? But what we do is we carry over into the Sabbath thoughts about work, thinking about work, and maybe even working. So the ideal here is not being finished with work, although God finished his work, being perfect as he was. 
The goal should be to finish our work in six days. That should be the goal, but rarely do we complete all the work that we feel like we need to do in a given week. Instead, the Sabbath means this. It means being free from the need to work, the internal need. It's being set free from it. Now, you may externally need to work, right? You may externally need to get things done. I'm talking about the internal need, this insatiable sometimes desire to feel like you've got to do something that's productive. And, of course, all that has to do with how we define productive. We're productive toward things outside of ourselves and sometimes not productive toward things that actually care for or for ourselves. And so the idea is to rest as if all your work is done. Wouldn't that be nice? Doesn't that sound like a place called home? To rest as if all your work is done. That's the idea. Next. There's this relationship here between work and worship. And later on what we're going to see is that this transfers now into worshiping God on the Sabbath. But at this point, you think through the Old Testament passage passages that talk about this there are these two related subjects work or the absence of work and worship and so we need to think about that correlation there because the ideal here is that work though good though established by God though it can be holy and can be worshipful in one sense work is not bad God God gave us you know productivity and and some of us have callings and we get to use our gifts that kind of thing so there can be a, a healthy response to working and to labor but the truth is is that work can get in the way of worship work can get in the way of our relationship to the lord so eventually the scriptures begin to develop principles and a structure around israel's worship The two things are directly related. Israel's cessation of normal work was to facilitate, later on, to facilitate her worship, okay? Someone once said that there is happiness in the love of labor, labor, but there is misery in the love of gain, right? I think that's really good. There is happiness in the love of labor, but when it goes to its extreme, and it turns into greed and to a need for more, then we become slaves to things. And as we become slaves to things, those things encroach upon our time. Okay? The result of our addiction to things, material things, doing things, is a blindness to all reality that fails to identify itself as a thing. If it's not material, if it can't be produced, if it's not activity-related, then we have a hard time in our Western culture understanding that as something to devote ourselves to. We're we're just activity-oriented, and it bleeds over into our response to God. Now, Religious activities, there's nothing inherently wrong, but think about it. Sometimes those activities can actually produce in us a mindset that unless we're doing that activity, we're not connecting to God. So we're talking about this difference between being and doing, the being-doing equation. The Sabbath is not about conquering things. It's not about conquering space. It's not about activity. It's about time. It's about conquering time, really. And we're going to come back to that theme in just a moment. Satan's ploy is to take these very good gifts and to take them to extremes. Next. True spiritual maturity requires the imitation of God. This is the whole parallel that you see in all these passages. What God did is what we should do. Isn't that what godliness is? To be godly is to be godlike? And so, to take a Sabbath is godlike. It is holy. It is, it is good. And then next, 
Here's that thing of this relationship between time and godliness. Here's what a guy named Abraham Herschel, by the way, this is a book that Vince Batista gave me um, right before I went on sabbatical. It's called The Sabbath, and this was written by a Jewish person. And it is a really, really good book. It's a hard read, though. <laughs> it's, it's kind of deep, but um, there are some really, really good thoughts in here. And if you're interested in that, come by and get the author's name and write this stuff down, and you can order the book. He says this. He says, there is a realm of time where the goal is not to have but to be. Listen to this. Not to own, but to give. Not to control, but to share. Not to subdue, but to be in accord. Life goes wrong when the control of space, the acquisition of things of space, becomes our sole concern. Okay, Not to do, but to be. We're more comfortable doing than being. And sometimes when we get still and we get quiet, we kind of have to hear ourselves. And we begin speaking truth to ourselves. And God begins speaking to us. And that can be a little unnerving for many of us, okay? It's about the sanctification of time. All right. You should see, I think in your notes, a full page that's an overview of Sabbath in the Old Testament. You, you all have that? Okay. Good. So you'll see the times that the Sabbath is mentioned and the context for which it's mentioned. And I just want to provide that to you. You can go back and read those passages. But let's fast forward now to the New Testament, to the Sabbath in Jesus. I've read a lot about this. A lot of people think that Jesus violated the Sabbath. Um, well, let's really think about that and look at the passages. Probably the, the biggest concerning passage was this Matthew 12 passage when the disciples were eating grain from the field on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees came up all hot and bothered, right? All upset. They shouldn't do this. What Jesus does, he responds in Matthew 12 by talking about how they're not being logically consistent that David, he, he provides the example of David. When David uh, came to the temple, he was um, given the showbread and received it from the priest, was hungry, was taking food, and the priest gave it to him, and Jesus uh, recites that David did it. And then, of course, he refers to the fact that priests work on the Sabbath, and there's no condemnation of those kinds of things. So Jesus is, again, just kind of using a rational argument to prove that they're, they're really not consistent in what they're saying and um, how minor the offense was. The disciples were hungry. And isn't it a good thing for a person to eat when they're hungry? <laughs> and that they would pick some grain from a field. And yet they were all upset. So this was all about, in Jesus' mind at least, it was all about proportions. right? It was all about the spirit of what God intended with the Sabbath. More than the law of what God had given with respect to the Sabbath. Jesus would say later on, he would say, listen, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. How in the world could the Pharisees be upset when Jesus healed people on the Sabbath and say you shouldn't do that? Yet they were. And look at all these examples. So the work that Jesus did on the Sabbath, all these are examples of him healing people who were either sick or lame or blind. The good work that Jesus did it makes much more sense when Jesus talks about, you know, what you guys are doing is you're straining gnats and swallowing camels. What did, what did he mean by that? What do you think? What did Jesus mean? He said, you strain gnats but swallow camels. You're sweating the small stuff. Good. Exactly. That's part of it. The other side of that coin is ignoring the big stuff, right? And so the big stuff of this good that he was doing, of course, was right in line with God's heart. Here's, here's his response in Matthew chapter 12. 
He says, or have you not read in the law? Don't you how, like how Jesus like does that? You know, because he knows that they had read it, right? Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless, profane the Sabbath? It's because they work on the Sabbath. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned, you would have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus was essentially saying that he is God. And what he says about the Sabbath in his day and age fulfills what God had established. It doesn't violate it. It fulfills the heart of God because he is the Lord of the Sabbath as God himself. Okay? So, let me ask you, what are some of the challenges, real challenges, that prevent us just, just as we're thinking about it right now, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about understanding, you know, the actual practice of Sabbath. What are some things that prevent us, though, from uh, putting this discipline of Sabbath rest into our lifestyle? What do you think? Overbooking our calendars. All right, good. Sports, demanding jobs, exactly. Some people are working, yeah. And we think as we discover the lack of faith that God somehow involved in the rest of our activities and we don't do it as much as we want to. Good. And we cannot trust in God to be engaged in our day-to-day lives and make them go better than they would have been. Right, so our mindset is, is you know, I've got to do this to get this output. And if I don't do this, then I'm not going to get this output. And it's being able to trust God with defining what that output is or should be. What else? Marcy? Yeah, could. disobedience, laziness. Absolutely. Yes. Good. Thanks, Sidarius. Exactly. So hopefully this is... This is knowledgeable um, in the sense it's going to help you to really live it and apply it. Okay, all these things are real. And then the other thing of just, again, this addiction that we have with just activity and work. Um, So here's what I want to talk to you about right now. Psalm 23. I was thinking about this. I thought about these words and how beautiful these words are. You know, a lot of times Psalm 23 is read at funerals. It's not really a psalm about death. It's about life. It's about living life. And these words are so powerful to us. Somebody read Psalm 23. It's a short psalm. It's there, I think, in your notes, or you can turn in your Bibles. Somebody read it for us. Good, thank you, Catherine. All right, beautiful words. And I want us to look at just the first few verses because all the benefits that are listed of this kind of lifestyle that, that David is writing about are really contained in the first few words. And here's, here's been my experience, and it may be yours as well. There is a fatigue that sets in in life that is often not cured with a good night's sleep. There's a difference between rest and restoration, right? I can rest my body, but wake up as weary spiritually and emotionally as when I went to sleep. It's what I like to call soul fatigue. It's a weariness of spirit and a weariness of heart. It's survival mode is what it is. 
and um, it can debilitate us in our lives where we're just we're we're going through the motions kind of a thing and I read this psalm and I see here in this psalm a picture of a vastly different way of doing life and it kind of calls toward us doesn't it the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul that's what God does That's the work of God in our lives. So let me give you a few signs of soul fatigue that I've come to understand to be true. First of all, a constant sense of being rushed. Of just being rushed from one place to the next. Some of this has to do with time management, which we'll talk about next week. You see in parentheses, survival mode. I found that word, of course, it's not particular to me, a word that I coined, but I actually looked it up a few years ago, what it meant. And survival mode is this um, mode in video games. And it's where the person that is under attack is on its very last level (laughs) before it dies. And our kids, you know, uh, have video games and stuff. And so it's the very last ounce of energy that this video game character has before you know it, it its life is ended that's survival mode and when you're in survival mode on the video game you got to find a way of replenishing that uh, energy that's in that character that's what it is and boy that's true for us right it's just that that living on this edge of of um, collapse a difficulty making decisions sometimes because of the rush of life and the sense of being overwhelmed. Surplus of information, but a deficit of wisdom. We don't feel we truly have wisdom for living. We've got a lot of information. You can read a lot of books, but you wonder where is real truth and where is true wisdom? Spiritual loneliness. What happens when you're in soul fatigue you feel distant from God. And that could be in the midst of spiritual activity. It could be right in the midst of going to worship and seeing Christian friends and that kind of thing. But when you lay your head down at night on your pillow, you, you go, I just, I really feel distant from God. And there's a spiritual isolation and loneliness that sets in. And then here's the truth, a decreased ability to love because the reservoirs for giving love are just empty. And so you get frustrated with the kids easier, the spouse, you know, you come home, you kick the dog, those kinds of things, and you just don't have this um, resource by which to give the most precious virtue to others, and that's love, patience. So let's dissect a little bit of the first words here of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Here's the key word. Of course, shepherd. And what essentially is a shepherd? A shepherd is a leader. Shepherd leads sheep. That's intuitive. So here's the question. Is God the shepherd or leader of my life? Is he? that's That's a question you really need to ask yourself. Or am I leading it on my own? Am I not following him? I'm going to places of my own accord, apart from him and his leadership. Because here's here's what's true. If God is the leader of my my life, then he will lead me to places of rest and replenishment. You can bet on that. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a part of God's leadership in our life to lead us to places of restoration. So is the Lord your shepherd? Next, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. Here's the key word, want. It really applies to contentment. If the Lord is my shepherd, if God is my leader... 
the immediate result of that is that I will not want. The immediate result is that I will be content. I will have this sense, because God is my shepherd, that I have enough right now. It's not an excuse for laziness. It's not an excuse, but I am content. Here's the question. Would my life be less stressful and complex if I would learn to be content with my possessions and my position? See, part of the complexity of life and part of the stress of life, part of the burnout of life, is because we are keeping, we continue to search for that thing which can never, ever be attained more. It's the constant desire for more. And so to be content with my possessions as they are right now. And you may still have bills to pay. You may have debt, that kind of thing. But to have this peace that for today I have what I need. And for this place in my life where God has me right now, it's enough for me. It's relationships, exactly. It is. It's relationships. It's, it's the idea that I need something that I don't have. When in reality, when in reality, when we have God, when the Lord is our shepherd, I shall not want. That's convicting, isn't it? Next. David says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I like that. He makes me, right? He has to make us sometimes. Key words here are rest and restoration. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Here's the question. Do I take the time to get the physical rest I need and to recreate? And both of those are really important. You really can't do one without the other. We'll talk about those in just a moment. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Um the whole ideal here is that um, God might have to force us to lie down and to rest. The old preacher said that if you don't take the Sabbath, eventually the Sabbath will take you. Right? In other words, you're going to get the Sabbath somehow. And, it, and the Sabbath might come because of health or an emotional breakdown or a relationship that gets shipwrecked. But if you continue at the rate and the speed that you're going, there will be a Sabbath, (laughs) and it will take you. So God needs to make us lie down sometimes. Do we take the time to get the rest that we need and to recreate? And he says, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's what God's done. God's work in our lives is not to drain our souls, but to restore our souls. Here's the key word, stillness. Stillness. We are so addicted to noise. And we're so addicted to people and things around us. To be still. To look and gaze at a flower. To look at the stars. To sit and think for more than 30 seconds. To be still before the Lord. Um, You know, some of us can't even drive in the car without having the radio on or be at home without the TV on. I had a friend of mine who moved away years ago. He couldn't be at his house by himself. If his wife or his kids were not there, he had to leave the house. I mean, he was just, he had to have people around him. And he would go find people or go hang out someplace. So here's the question. Do I have the ability to sit still, to listen to my Lord? We're going to be talking about prayer beginning this Sunday. Prayer A part of prayer is not just to talk to God, it's to listen to God. There's a dialogue in prayer, not a monologue. And so to sit still, to listen, and to enjoy fellowship with Him. See, sometimes this is so foreign to us, it's actually hard to enjoy the stillness. We we get through it, we bear it, (laughs) but to enjoy it, which means it takes a discipline for us and for us to commit ourselves to this thing called Sabbath so that we can develop this lifestyle. So here are some applications for us. And I think we're probably going to finish a little bit early tonight. Maybe we can have some questions. Here's the applications for us. First of all, 
the first key word to apply this is retreat. Here's the dictionary definitions of retreat. I, I think all of them apply. The forced or strategic withdrawal of an army or an armed force before an enemy. That's pretty good for us, I think. The act of withdrawing as into safety or privacy, retirement, seclusion. A place of refuge, seclusion, or privacy. And here's, here's my favorite one. An asylum, as for the insane. Yeah, sometimes a retreat is, is that island of sanity to get away. So here's what we really mean. To escape normal ongoing activity for purposes of restoration. I want to challenge you what you think is restoring. And some of this is based upon my own experience. All right. We've already talked about this. What keeps us from retreating for Sabbath? Here's an idea I want to share with you. The Sabbath serves as the antidote to the idea that I'm indispensable to the world. That's the first part of this. This is why I think God gave us the gift of the Sabbath. Is this discipline that we engage in that makes us practice the fact that we are not indispensable. We are dispensable. <laughs> the world can go on without us. No matter how important you are, the world can just go on. Things can be done without you. And here's the second part of that. And the things that we give ourselves to six days a week are indispensable to us. The Sabbath is the antidote to that. See, it's not just we believe the world can't get along without us. In truth, many times we have a hard time taking the Sabbath because we can't get along without the world. And it cuts both ways. It's the antidote to this crazy world that we live in. Retreat. Second, recreation. We'll say recreation. Recreation in mind, body, and spirit. This is part of the goal of the Sabbath. Recreating the mind. Now, this does not mean mindless activity. And I've... I've come to understand that because I used to think that the Sabbath for me was just getting home from church and laying on the couch and watching football and sleeping. But the irony is, and you guys know this to be true, how many of you have ever sat through five to six hours of television straight and got up from the couch and said, my, I feel refreshed? <laughs> no. I'm more tired than I was when I sat down. So engaging the mind is different than entertaining the mind. This was the thing I learned. I would entertain my mind with just mindless stuff. We call it vegging out. Like We like to use that. Well, I'm just vegging out. Nothing wrong with sitting for a while. I'm not saying that. But the mind is renewed and recreated through thoughts that engage our mind to think about things that we don't normally think about. So reading a good book, watching a good movie, you know, the right kind of movie that causes you to think and engage your mind, art, music. That's what we're talking about here is recreating the mind, restoring the mind, not just sitting in front of the television and vegging out. So what is it that does that for you? You've got to identify that. And I guarantee each one of you have something that, that uh, delights the mind, that engages the mind, that, that piques the mind, that gets, gets those synapses firing. And it's not thinking about work and not that kind of stuff. If you read a book, you don't want to read a book about how to work better. right? That's what I like to do. I like to read how-to books. I like to read church books. I like to read leadership <laughs> books. I've had to go away from that. I read this book. This was totally different than what I normally read. I've tried to pick up, I have a friend of mine, 
I graduated with from high school, he's become a uh, fiction writer. And he's quite popular. It's kind of fun. So he sent me two or three of his books, and so I'm picking those up. I never read fiction. I don't like fiction. But I, I'm making myself read different kinds of things. And it's engaging the mind in a different way. As far as body is concerned, you know, the body is important to be worked and to be recreated. And that means some kind of physical activity. Yes, rest is important. Absolutely. You've got to, sometimes, folks, the most spiritual thing that you can do is to get a good night's rest. Is to not stay up and read your Bible. And to not do, sometimes the most spiritual and holy thing that you can do is to rest your physical body. But that doesn't necessarily recreate your body. It doesn't necessarily restore your body as it should. So some physical activity that tears down muscle and rebuilds muscle is part of the key to, I think, a Sabbath kind of lifestyle. It, it renews the body. If you talk to people who work out, like, really work out, they, they talk about that breakdown, but then that build up. And it's, a, it's like a, a, the body being renewed over and over and over again. And that's a good thing. And the discipline of physical exercise, correct, uh, proportionate physical exercise, can be actually very, very recreating to the body. And then spirit. Spirit, of course. And I'm not talking about always spiritual activity. And, of course, the Sabbath is a sign for us to worship and serve. And that should be, that should actually be a restoring kind of thing for us. If worship and serving is not restoring to our spirit, then something's not right. We either have the wrong attitude or we're doing the wrong thing. That's a part of it. And our Sabbath on Sundays now, we worship and we serve. And we have a church full of people who are serving and giving themselves to the work of ministry. That should be a replenishing and restoring kind of thing. It really should. Otherwise, you might have the wrong attitude toward it. Um, and then here in a few weeks, we're going to talk about serving in such a way that you don't get burned out. Uh, we need to protect our church from burnout. We really do. But anyway, those are activities. But it's not always about worshiping and serving. It's also about just sitting and being and sensing God's pleasure upon your life and your, his smile and um, engaging in things in such a way that reminds you about the profound nature of God, um, creation. How often do we look at this beautiful creation around us that we're passing through every day? <laughs> It's, it's around us. You know, we were driving to Huntsville and, um, last weekend, and the flowers are blooming like crazy on the side of the road, and uh, my daughter's in the back with her cell phone. I, you know, Kaylee, look, uh, look at all those flowers. And she looked up finally, whoa, and they were beautiful, the yellow and blue and that kind of thing. And if you sit to ponder those things for a little bit, not just look at them, but notice them, there's a difference between seeing and noticing. Notice the things of God all around us. And particularly on a Sabbath, you can soak in the enjoyment of God's presence in your life. That's what we're talking about. All right, so that's recreation. Relationships. In Jewish culture in particular, the Sabbath was all about relationships, particularly family. So... One of the things that you need to embrace, that all of us need to embrace, is that there are people who drain you and there are people who put life into you. And as a part of your sanity and as part of Sabbath keeping and a Sabbath lifestyle, you need to surround yourself, particularly on the Sabbath, with people who give life to you, not drain life from you. That can be kind of hard. <laughs> You might have kids or something. It's like, you know, I don't know what you do. But somehow relationships that um, build up and that encourage us and that we're at home and at peace with, that can be a real strong part of a Sabbath lifestyle. And then we talked about restoration, the whole idea of restoring ourselves, love of God, love for others, peace in life. To identify the things that restore, this is part of what you have to do. Because you're just kind of thinking it's going to happen. 
you, you need to identify the things, the people, the places that do restore you and then have disciplines to retreat to those people and places. It's a commitment that you will make. Which leads to this last thing. This commitment, this is a discipline. Any, any command that God gives us, the way that we get to enjoy the spirit of the command, the benefits of the command, is through the discipline of obeying the command. So, like the discipline of the tithe, I begin to think about this, how similar the tithe is and how similar it is to um, the Sabbath. Both are disciplines. Both are commands. And the ideal here is that the tithe has very similar qualities to the discipline of the Sabbath. But both of them are acts of faith. It is trusting God. This goes back to what Ron said. It is trusting God that he knows best. And that I'm going to obey him at these very real points in my life. Is there anything more precious to us than our time and our money? I can't think of, hopefully our families, right? Danielle's saying her husband is, right? No, but you know what I mean. Outside of that, right? I mean, our time and our money, those are our kind of most precious commodities, and so, in fact, some people would spend more money in order to have more time, free time. I mean, those, there's a relationship there. But here, here are some of the similarities, and this is going to help you to put into practice this idea of the Sabbath. First of all, in both of these, I'm imitating God. When I give, I'm imitating a giving God. When I'm generous, I'm imitating a generous God. When I practice the Sabbath and when I rest and when I restore, I'm doing exactly what God did when he created the earth. And there should be an identification that we have with the Father in that. It is a spiritual notion. It is a holy thing to Sabbath. It really is. And um, I am like God in that sense. I'm also drawn closer to God. Because when I imitate God, I become godly, and I'm becoming closer to him as a result of these disciplines. So you've got to understand the difference between legalism and discipline. Good disciplines lead to good, heartfelt, spiritual kinds of things. There is good in discipline. And sometimes we have to make ourselves do certain things in order to eventually feel the benefit of doing those things. You know this to be true. I mean, there are certain things that you don't always want to do, but you know you should do. And narrowing that gap between should do and want to do is a key to living life. It means that we're people of integrity. It means that we're doing what we think is important, what we value. So if I can discipline myself to trust God to do what he says I should do, then guess what will happen? The spirit of that discipline will follow. And the feelings from that discipline will eventually catch up to the action of the discipline. Somebody once said that it's much easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. Right? I don't always feel like waking up. But I get up because I know I should. I get in the shower, and guess what happens? My emotions begin to catch up with my body. And I begin to feel good about the fact that I got up. Because I felt like now I'm a person of integrity. I did what I should have done, and I begin to feel that as a result. I can't tell you how many times people have told me, I didn't feel like coming to church today, but I'm so glad I did. <laughs> this was the day I needed to be here. And so the feeling flowed from the action and guys if we will have the courage and build this discipline into our lives we'll begin to see the benefits of it next it is it is an antidote to our culture <laughs> tithing is the antidote to materialism and greed sabbath keeping is the antidote to a culture that 
just goes fast and furious all the time. It blesses me in return. Both of these are spending something, but the blessing in return. It's to give in order to receive. And that's true with giving and tithing, and it's true with the Sabbath. It is raining in my time. And we'll talk about more, more of this next week. It is telling my time what to do rather than it telling me what to do. And when I do that, it blesses me in return. It sets my priorities in proper place. If there's anything that the discipline of tithing and the Sabbath does for you, it, it reveals and unveils what your priorities are. Right? It reveals and unveils who's number one. Are you number one? And will I trust you with my money? And will I trust you with my time? Here's the thing about both of these. Both are proportional, both are systematic, and both are sacrificial. So the tithe is one-tenth. That's the guideline, okay? Not the legalism, but the guideline. The Sabbath is one-seventh. It is systematic. The Sabbath is every seven days. The tithe is based upon our income. It should be regular part of what we receive. We also give. And then it's sacrificial. Both are sacrificial. Both are giving up something that are precious to us. And here's the last thing. Both reveal my level of practical trust, practical faith in God. After all, it's easy to talk about having faith. But when you give a portion of your time and money to the Lord, this is where you're giving evidence of your faith in a practical sense. It is a practical expression of your faith. In fact, I would say it like this. To not practice those is practical atheism. A practical lack of faith. Now, don't take that to some legalistic extreme, okay? But just know that in the long term, if I'm not practicing what God said I should practice, resulting from my lack of faith and belief in Him, that He will provide for me, He will provide for me though I give Him one-seventh of my week without activity when there are a ton of things that need to get done. that I will trust him with one-tenth of all that he's blessed me with, when there are a ton of things to spend money on, <laughs> it is practical atheism. It is just not trusting God at his word. And that's true certainly of the Sabbath. Say, God, I'm going to trust you enough that I'm going to stop activity and I'm going to get to the point in the spirit in my heart to be free from the need, the addiction to work. And I'm going to trust you that the world's going to continue without me. I'm going to trust you that in the long term, things will get done. And part of the amazing thing of living in the Sabbath is it's amazing how the rest of the time becomes more efficient. And the other six sevenths become more effective. the simple principle of the Sabbath because what? God's wisdom works. God knows best. And if we'll do it, we'll find the benefits of it. All right. I want to um, end with this quote right here. This is from this book. We need the Sabbath in order to survive civilization. Gallantly, ceaselessly, quietly, man must fight for inner liberty to remain independent from the enslavement of the material world. Inner liberty depends upon being exempt from domination of things as well as from domination of people. This is our constant problem. 
how to live with people and remain free, how to live with things and remain independent from them. That's the key, isn't it? And that's why God gave us the Sabbath. All right. Questions. We've got about two or three minutes. Any questions or comments? Linda, I sent you an email today because I asked you about, I know, you, she, I'm on her junk mail. <laughs> I'm on her spam list. No, no, but I was asking you, since we were talking about the Hebrew concepts of the Sabbath, if, if you had anything to add to it at the end, we'd love to hear from you. Linda, you guys, Linda teaches Hebrew at the Bible Seminary. Um, she really is an expert in Old Testament and Jewish thought. So it's always good to have her here when we talk about such kinds of Hebrew and ancient concepts like the Sabbath. <laughs> exactly. Anything to add? Anybody? Yes, Dennis? Yeah. It depends on work. I wouldn't say you should not do any work. Now, if you're doing activities that restore you, that some people would call work, I like, like you and Kim love to work out in the yard, well, that would not be replenishing to me. Not at all. <laughs> right. Absolutely. No, that's restoring. And that's what I'm talking about. It's not just sitting on the couch. It's engaging and you're out there and you're, I mean, your mind is going and you love it. And your hands are getting dirty. That's, that's recreating yourself. Good question. Exactly. What about it? Exactly. That's right. You have time to reflect. Dan and I talk about this some. I'm not going to tell you the example, but it's often in those off times from work that your mind engages uh, even better than at work. Isn't it funny how your mind kind of gets in a rut at work, but then when you're out driving or doing something that is different, you can actually kind of think in a more clear, in a more clear way. Good. Anything else? Why do we have the Sabbath on Sunday? That's right. The seventh day in the Jewish week was what day? Saturday, right. So why do we have it on Sunday? And do we really, do we really, the Greek God? Okay, well, that's a good theory. That's wrong, but it's a good theory. No, I mean, I think that is. If you think about that culture in the first century, right, there were pagans and there was gr Greeks who were becoming Christians, so I can understand why you might would think that. It's about the resurrection. Christians began to celebrate and worship on Resurrection Sunday. And so in that sense is why we worship on Sundays now. And in the Jewish week, it was the f Sunday was the first day of the week. We kind of think of it as the last day of the week. Anything else? Linda, I know you're thinking. Amen. Good. Yeah. Good. Mm. Mm. That's a good point. Mm. That's good. So it's the first part of the income. It's the last part of the week. Is that kind of what you're saying? That's right. That's right. Good. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, good. Very good. I've never heard it either, so when I came across it this week, I was pretty excited. <laughs> and probably you guys have heard it, but it, it was novel to me. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Marcy. All right. Thanks for being here tonight. We're going to talk about time. And there's some cool concepts of time from the scripture. We're going to look at Psalm 90 um, next week. The oldest psalm. It's a psalm of Moses. And we're going to look at that part of that psalm where he prays, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And then we're going to transfer that to the New Testament, talk about concepts of time in the New Testament. So let's stand. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Y'all are awesome. And um, Phil Patillo, would you please close us in prayer? Thank you.